lecture this week. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, we do have another regional business center representative with us this evening. Uh, it's just Elizabeth. She's actually standing right now. So if you do have any questions regarding the regional business center, please feel free to ask her. Uh, and also following the lecture this evening, we will be going to Hourglass located on Cedar Street for our startup drink. So everyone is welcome to join us. Uh, so tonight we have David, who is a lawyer, patent, and trademark agent with Norton Rose Fulbright. Uh, David's, David practice focus on the creation and protection of intellectual property assets in Canada, the United States, and around the world. So we're pleased to have him with us this evening. Great. Thanks, Haley. <clears throat> Um, so as Haley mentioned, yeah, my practice is mainly focused on advising clients as to how to manage intellectual property, how to strategize about intellectual property, um, and how to acquire intellectual property rights, whether it's filing for patent, uh, filing patent applications or, or trademark applications um, in various jurisdictions around the world. Um, so one of my first personal experiences with IP was actually during my undergrad when I was doing a work, uh, an engineering work term at a little outfit in Waterloo called Research in Motion. Um, and back then they were this really small, innovative company. They had provided email on your phones before phones were smart. Like, they were way ahead of the game. Um, and while I was there on my work term, they were sued for patent infringement by this company called NTP in the United States. Um, so here's this, here this great company doing all these great new things and their business model was potentially getting threatened by uh, a patent. Um, and that kind of opened their eyes and from there they spawned off and started building their own patent portfolio. Um, and it really opened their eyes to this world of IP. Um, and so today I hope to help um, provide you guys with a basic understanding of that so you're prepared um, for any of the challenges that might come up or just to keep things in mind, strategies and kind of basic um, protection strategies or things to keep in mind as you, as you progress in your business to avoid um, problems down the road. Um, these should apply whether you're a startup, whether you're a small business owner, whether you're a researcher, um, whether you're an employee or you you're someone who hires third-party contractors. All of these can have potential IP um, considerations. Um, so hopefully I'll touch on those today. Um, so what is IP? Uh, an IP right uh, is, some, is, a, is an intangible asset. And it is an asset. It's something that can be sold, something that can be traded, something that can be licensed. Um, it has a value. It, it's something that's difficult to value. It's not a piece of property, it's not a house or a car or a building or inventory, um, but it is something that sh can show up on a balance sheet and add a significant value to a company. Um, uh, IP generally are a bundle of rights which prevent others from, from copying, using, or selling um, your ideas or your creations. Uh, so there are a number of forms of IP, uh, <laughs> patents, trademarks, uh, copyright, I'm going to be touching on these later, industrial designs, uh, trade secrets, uh, integrated circuit topologies, which are basically, I'm, going to, I'm not going to really talk about integrated circuit topologies or plant readers rights, but circuit topologies are basically if you've designed this chip uh, and certain masking masks to develop a computer chip. Um, plant readers rights, if you have different varieties, if you develop a variety of a certain plant, there are laws that protect those. Um, <clears throat> so why is IP important? Um, so, so as someone who practices in the area, I like to think that what I do is important. <laughs> um, but why should this matter to you? Uh, <clears throat> IP, if, if you're doing any sort of innovation, IP should be considered part of the investment in that innovation. Um, it protects your innovation. It can potentially monetize your innovation. Um, and as a startup, if you are a startup, what you're doing is likely trying to do something new or you're trying to do some, something that's different than anybody else. Um, and so the value in what you bring to the table is that you are doing something new. But if you present that to somebody and somebody says, oh, that's a great idea, the only thing that's stopping them 
potentially from just copying that idea and do it themselves and, and totally cutting you out of the picture um, is IP and, and the way you protect that IP. Another benefit of IP is kind of related to that is it does attract investment, it does increase your valuation. There was a little study done um, by Harvard um, a year or two ago that showed that startups who had at least one patent were almost twice as likely to get funding um, than startups did, that did not. And often those startups had valuations of uh, over a million dollars just after the difference between having a, a patent and not having one a difference of initial difference of at least a million dollars. So um, not every not every patent is going to give you that. Not every company is going to give you that. Um, but just something to keep in mind. Uh, <clears throat> as you're developing, it, it protects it protects your ideas as you're ramping up. Um, there are different strategies we can we'll talk about a little bit later where you can cover kind of the high level ideas and then dig a little bit further down into the details. And as, as, you, as you develop, you can great, get better valuations for your company, whether that's through branding um, companies like Coca-Cola and Apple and things like that. A huge part of their value now is in their branding and their, and, and their name. Um, uh, IP, and again, IP is not, since the IP is not something physical, you have to think about it on a global level because ideas, ideas don't have boundaries, they don't have borders. Ideas can flow back and forth. Um, so you have to be thinking kind of on a global scale because um, patent protection, trademark protection, they have to be filed on a, on a country by country basis. Um, enforcement is a challenge. Um, sometimes can be expensive, but there are ways around that. Um, and it's not as, as difficult as people can Usually litigation is kind of a last resort. Um, you can try and wave patents around and, and ask people to stop. You can license. There are lots of ways of, of avoiding kind of a big fight in the courts, which is a, a long and expensive process. Uh, patents also help provide a defensive mechanism from competitors. Um, I actually had a, a client the other day who was talking and they mentioned, oh, one of our competitors was thinking about suing us for some patent infringement, something that was related to what we're doing. And they learned somehow that they ended up not pursuing that litigation um, because my client had their own patent portfolio and they didn't want to start this war of who's got a bigger war chest of patents in their back pocket. Um, Patents also provide a defensive publication. So if you keep kind of your new technology secret and you, you do it yourself and don't share it with the world and maybe it's something software that's running on your own server in the background that no one knows about or some secret formula, some secret composition, um, that's great if you can protect it and keep it as a trade secret. Um, but if it is something that's discoverable or something that someone else might come up with, if it's a very busy industry that everyone's looking for this thing, um, if you don't disclose it or don't file a patent application for it and they discover it and they file a patent application for it, um, now they can potentially come after you even if you might have done it first but you didn't ever disclose it, you never shared that with the world. Um, so that can be a problem. So I don't know if you guys can see this, this is a little bit small. Um, this is kind of a table comparing the different types of IP or the main types of IP. So patents cover ideas or inventions. Um, so these things are things like machines, methods, processes, and improvements of, of doing these things. Um, patents generally last for 20 years from the date they, that the patent application is filed. Um, designs, in Canada they're called industrial designs, in the US they're called design patents. Um, rather than the utility or the use of an invention, um, of what a regular patent, a utility patent would cover. Designs cover kind of the ornamental or the visual aspects. So for example, the Coca-Cola bottle with kind of curves in the ribs, um, that would be an industrial design. Or the Bodum double-walled glasses, or for example, the Volkswagen Beetle, um, the shape of that, those would all be considered industrial designs. Um, 
Copyright, everyone's kind of familiar with copyright. This covers some sort of creativity or some expression of an idea. So this would be movies, books, um, music. But it also covers things like software code um, or even instruction manuals or anything, any way that you can express kind of a concept or an idea. Uh, trademarks, uh, these are your brands, these are your, your Coca-Cola, your Apple, whether it's a word, it could be a symbol, whether it's this, the apple with the bite out of it, that's a trademark. Um, you can trademark sounds now, uh, which is a relatively new, so for example, like the MGM lion roar, that, that's, that's trademarked. Um, you can also, you're starting to be able to trademark colors and, um, and smells, and these are all kind of relatively new, so we'll see how you can test whether a smell is distinctive over something else. But. Uh, and trade secrets is kind of an alternative to the patent world. Um, when you file for a patent, you have to, you have to disclose your invention. Uh, and we'll cover that a little bit later. Um, but if it's something you don't want to disclose, um, then it's something you want to consider as a trade secret. Because, uh, for example, the, the Coca-Cola formula or secret recipe for Coca-Cola, if they file a patent for that, if, if it was patentable, um, they would only have protection for 20 years for that. And after that, anybody could use it. Um, whereas if they keep it as a sec trade secret, that could, that could last indefinitely. So what is a patent? Uh, a patent protects inventions. Um, as I, I said earlier, it protects processes and methods, um, devices, machines, articles of manufacture. It can cover um, new chemical formulations. It can cover new pharmaceutical drugs. Patents are territorial, so if you want protection around the world, you have to file patent application in every country that you're seeking protection. Um, there are regional patents, such as in Europe and Africa and the Middle East, certain different regions have, have regional ones which will give you protection over a number of countries. Um, but again, they are all individual filings that you have to make. Um, patents are granted by, again, patents are this kind of artificial legal right that, that governments um, provide to you. So patent, the patent offices are administered by the governments in each different jurisdiction. And they provide you the exclusive right to make, use, or sell your invention. Um, so if you, file, if you get a granted patent, it doesn't mean that suddenly you're gonna start getting paid or you're gonna start making money. What the patent gives you a right to do is to stop others from doing it. So you have, to, you have to police it yourself. You have to either say, you're infringing on my patent, you have to pay me a royalty or license this, or if it ends up, you, you'd have to, you, could, you could file a lawsuit to stop somebody, um, but you have to enforce it yourself. So the, the right of a patent comes from, or it gives, it arises from the inventor. So the first owner of a patent is the inventor. Um, so this is something to keep in mind if you are a company or a startup uh, to make sure you have the proper agreements in place to transfer that ownership from the inventors to your company. Um, and as I said before, typically the, the term of a patent is 20 years from the date of filing. So why do we have patents? Why does a government give you a monopoly? Um, generally, uh, at least the underlying theory is that innovation is important to the growth of the economy. And so in exchange for you sharing your idea and your, your new concepts with the world, the government is going to grant you a 20-year monopoly to, to recoup your costs to make money on that, that idea. Um, and at the end, that becomes public. And after that 20-year period, anybody can continue to use and make your, your idea. So it, it pushes innovation. It pushes the economy forward. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is the, your patent application is published well before the 20-year period is up. And so 
this can give your competitors the ability to file patents or make improvements to your, your technology, which is kind of the, the, the point of the system, is that people can see what you're doing and how do I make that better? How can I apply this to my field? Um, so that's why it's also important to, if you are in a space and you are filing a patent application, to keep on top of things, keep filing for new developments as you build on top of your original filing. Um, one thing to keep in mind also that that trips up a lot of people is a patent does not give you the right to practice your invention. Uh, for example, if you created some new steering mechanism, an automatic steering mechanism on a car, um, that doesn't necessarily, if you have a patent that covers that technology, that doesn't necessarily mean you can, you can practice that technology without potentially infringing on someone else's patent. So if there's a steering mechanism in a car that is done by a manual car and you just tack on your computer and your sensors on top of that, um, you can't make the car without having the kind of underlying manual steering mechanism. Um, so you'd be infringing on a patent on that potentially, even though your technology sits on top of it. Um, or another example is if you have uh, some sort of application that uses GPS on your phone, if GPS is covered by a patent, um, you by practicing your invention of, of using GPS on your phone, would be potentially infringing that other patent. So it doesn't give you a right to practice your, pat your invention per se, it, but it does give you a right to stop others from using that specific aspect that's in your, your patent. So what does a patent look like? Uh, this is a little bit small. On the right here, there's a, there's a picture of a, a PCTA application, which is an international patent application. Um, it has uh, most patents look a little bit different for different jurisdictions, but they all kind of have the same pieces. Um, basic things like the title, your abstract, which is a summary, um, what field of technology it relates to, uh, background information. Uh, I, I'm going to go into these in a little bit more detail. Uh, the summary, disclosure, drawings, and then claims. If there's one thing you take away from today and in patents is the claims are the key to any, any patent, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on that. So in your description, um, you need to describe how to make and use your patent as if you were giving instructions to, to somebody who is kind of skilled in this area. Um, this is kind of that exchange that, that I mentioned before. In exchange for disclosing your invention, you're getting this monopoly, so you have to disclose your invention. Um, so that means teaching people how to make it, how to use it, and that has to be all described in your patent. Um, uh, so if I have this, this GPS unit in my car, um, and, my, cl and my, my invention is, some specific aspect of how I use the GPS to navigate the car, to make the car navigate on its own. Um, I have to describe a whole bunch of things. I have to describe the GPS system, potentially I have to describe part of the steering mechanism. Um, but how does somebody know what my invention is or what I am seeking a monopoly on? That's divined, that is what is, shows up in the claims. So we just have a couple more pictures here. This is uh, an example of a US, what a US patent application looks like. Um, this is just the cover page. So these are usually 15, 20 page documents. Um, as you can see, you have the, the title uh, uh, and the, a picture of, of what the item there is. Um, this one's called a method and apparatus for making a sandwich. <laughs> so as you can see, you can get a patent for almost any sort of technology. Um, this application is actually, was actually filed by McDonald's. Um, and what this is for is you would put all the ingredients for your sandwich in these little slots, um, put the bun on top and then flip it over and just put the two parts together and I guess it would simplify the, <laughs> the, the burger or sandwich making process. Um, 
Um, here's the same application that was filed in Canada. So it looks very similar, um, slightly different format. And again, the PCT, which is an international filing. Um, so this is the claim of, of this device. Um, so the claim is basically your fence. This is where you're drawing the boundary of what you are seeking to protect, what you are seeking to get your 20 year monopoly on. Um, the challenge with claims and building this fence um, is that it's a fence made of words. And so these words are open to interpretation. Um, so it's not a physical fence where you know exactly the boundaries of them. Sometimes these, these can mold and shift depending on interpretation. Um, as you'll note, there's a, a main claim, which we refer to as an independent claim. And then claims two, three, and four are all dependent claims. So they are a more detailed version of claim one. So these dependent claims you can think of as an inner fence um, that cover, actually cover a smaller area than the, the bigger outer fence, which is the claim one. Um, so in essence, Generally speaking, then, uh, a claim that has fewer words or, or fewer features in it actually has broader protection than one that has maybe a page of, of text in it uh, that describes your invention. So while we want to be accurate in our claims and make sure they cover your invention and, and your product that you're actually selling, your claims also should be broad enough that they cover kind of obvious variants so that someone can't just easily work around your invention. Um, the other challenge with drafting claims is if your claim is too broad, um, if it encompasses something that's already known or something that's um, being sold out in the world or somebody's described it in a paper somewhere, that claim is not valid anymore. Uh, it, this, goes all, this goes back to this idea of if you, you're disclosing this new idea to the world, well, if it's not actually new, why should I give you a monopoly on it? And so if your idea is not new, some piece of art out there, some piece of, some reference out there describes what you are describing in your fence, um, your, your idea is not new anymore. And so that fence falls and you do not have patent protection for that anymore. So this is why we also draft these dependent claims because if your outer fence falls, you can potentially still get protection for your inner fence if, if the prior art does not disclose the things in these dependent claims. Um, so maybe here's a more a simpler example. What we have is a, a basic claim to a chair. The chair comprises a seat, um, operable to bear the weight of a user, a back attached to the seat, and two or more legs attached to the seat. The legs for engaging a surface beneath the chair. Um, so if chairs were new, <laughs> you could potentially get a claim for this. Um, but this claim, so this claim would cover, for example, the picture on the right, which is a chair with a back. Um, but because it says back in the claim, that is a limitation that has to be in there. So it could potentially not cover the chair on the left, which is not the stool on the left, which does not have a back. Um, so a better way to claim this would have been to not have the back in that claim. You could have put the back in a dependent claim. Um, so as you can see, it's kind, of a, it's kind of this game that we play. How do we claim our invention and think about, well, I could have had a chair without a back and I could have covered that um, and got protection for that. So what are the requirements for a patent? Um, there's four main requirements. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it has to be new, it has to be useful, it has to be the right kind of subject matter, and it has to be non-obvious or inventive. So the, the new requirement is fairly objective. It's, has, is, is what you're doing new? Has anyone done this before? Um, but more, it's more than just is something, is this out in the marketplace? It's, is it new in the, sense as, in the sense that nobody has ever talked about this, nobody has disclosed this, this has not been written up somewhere, even if it's never been actually put into a product, it can be deemed not new if, if somebody wrote about it or that information is somewhere out in the general, in the public knowledge. Um, and this goes back to that idea of 
if you don't haven't done any, if you're not sharing something new with the world and that the world potentially knows about it, um, then you shouldn't get a monopoly for it. Uh, and this is fairly strict. Um, in Canada, it could be a disclosure anywhere in the world. So if there is some article that's in some obscure library in, in Nepal somewhere, in, a, in not in English, in some foreign language, no one's ever checked out that book, um, and it describes your invention, your invention would still not be new, even though no one's ever looked at that. The, the fact that that information is publicly available means your, that idea is no longer new. So it is, it's fairly a strict test, um, but it's, it's an objective one, unlike the non-obviousness, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, useful, is, is your patent useful? This is a fairly low threshold. Um, does it do something useful? Does it do what it says it's gonna do? Uh, for, so for example, you couldn't get a patent for cold fusion or something unless you somehow demonstrated that you actually did it and it actually worked. Um, you couldn't get a patent for a time machine per se unless you could come somehow demonstrate that that actually worked. Like it has to do something useful um, and it has to do what it says it's gonna do. Patentable subject matter is an interesting one. This one's kind of in the news a lot more lately. Um, you, can, uh, you can't get a patent for, the governments uh, and, the, and the courts have said you can't get patents for certain types of inventions. Um, so for example, you can't get a patent for laws of nature. You can't patent gravity. Um, you can't Patrick, uh, patent uh, abstract ideas. Um, so things like mathematical formulas. Uh, you can't patent um, potentially like a new, finan new financial product. These are sometimes considered abstract ideas. Um, but there are ways of getting around this. So while you can't patent gravity, you could potentially patent um, some sort of hydroelectric, hydroelectric um, turbine which relies on some gravity to spin when water falls and then spins the wheel. Um, or for example, you could, um, you could patent, uh, I guess, equals M. MC squared is not a great example, but you could, if there was some relatively involved with a plane that's flying at very high speeds or some spacecraft, um, you could potentially patent a, a certain technology, some engine that, that might adjust um, some sort of navigation or some sort of reading based on that formula, but you just couldn't patent the formula itself. Um, so where patentable subject matter these days have been hitting challenges is this idea of software business methods. Um, a lot of courts now are saying, if all you're doing is taking some sort of mathematical formula or some series of steps that's generally doable by hand, um, albeit less efficiently, and just putting on a computer and saying, okay, now I'm do doing a, using a computer, um, they're saying that these ideas are not patentable. Um, so in the past, you could, you could almost do anything and say, now I'm putting on a computer, a computer is this physical machine, um, and so now I'm, I'm getting a patent for it. But now the courts are saying, well, computers are ubiquitous. Um, everybody knows computers can be programmed to do almost anything. Uh, so if I'm taking e equals mt squared, or I'm taking some sorting formula, um, and now I'm just saying, okay, do it on a computer, they're saying that that is not patentable. Um, so the challenge for us now is to, how do we craft our claims? How do we draft our applications to say, no, we're not just using some formula. Um, what we're doing is actually, we're improving the computer process. We're making the pro computer a bit faster. We're using a little bit less memory. Um, we're taking less steps to do things. Um, and that way we can kind of characterize your invention in a way that does fit into these, these statutory categories. Another area uh, is medical diagnostics. There's been a lot of cases where um, patents are being invalidated 
because you're just taking some, some observation you made or some discovery you made about how the human body works or how a certain gene presents itself and you're using um, just common diagnostics methods of, of extracting genes and isolating genes and those are all known so all you're doing is taking this natural phenomenon and you're applying well-known techniques to it and so the patent offices are saying you can't get a patent for that anymore and, and this is an area of law that, that's quite evolving um, and is, uh, is being challenged a lot um, so we'll, we'll have to see, keep an eye on how where this goes. Um, so these first three requirements of new, new useful and patentable subject matter are, are pretty easy for us to, to, to distill down to on an initial call or they're fairly objective. You can kind of get a sense that is this probably new? Um, the challenge though is the last step, the last main requirement, which is this idea of being non-obvious or inventive. And this is a much more subjective test. Unlike the novelty test where has this been done or disclosed anywhere, that's kind of black or white. But whether something is obvious, if I combine two things, if I combine a car and a GPS and somehow just put them together, is that obvious? Um, if I take an, a pencil and I take an eraser and I just put them together so that they're on, they're on one, one item, is that obvious? Um, it's not as black and white of, of an answer. Um, So how can we tell if, if your idea is new or how can we tell if your idea is patentable? Um, one way of doing this is to do a search before we file anything. Um, this can help us identify what's actually new in your product. If you have a, a system that's doing a whole bunch of things, if we do a search, um, we can potentially narrow it down and focus on what's really inventive uh, of, in your system. Um, the search will also tell you what potentially what your competitors are doing. It can identify competitors who are filing in this area. Um, and it can tell you what areas they're filing in, where they think the technology might be going. Um, okay. So back to the, this novelty requirement, it must be new. You have to file your patents um, in a timely manner. So you have to file patents before you disclose them to the public. Um, so whether you're talking to investors, whether you're doing a, um, some sort of funding round or you're doing a crowdfunding page, um, these can all potentially be considered public disclosures, disclosures, which can potentially bar you from getting a patent for your idea if you didn't file before them. Um, there are countries, Canada, U.S., um, Australia is one, where you do have a one-year grace period if, that if you did disclose your idea to the public within that first year, you can still file for patent protection. Um, but other countries, such as Europe, uh, many countries in Europe, many countries in Asia, and most of the world, actually, um, there's an absolute novelty requirement. So if you disclose, there's no grace period. Um, you can't get a patent for it anymore. Um, there, are, there are ways around for deferring costs and using international treaties um, and related patent applications where you can, you don't have to file everywhere in the world um, at once. You can file in one country first and within a year you can file in, in any other country and still claim priority back to that first di filing date. Um, so you can file a, a patent first in Canada or the US, disclose it to the world wherever else um, do your funding, do whatever else, and then uh, within a year, then you can file a, a uh, corresponding patents um, in Europe and China and still be okay. So confidential disclosures are potentially not uh, a public disclosure. So if you're meeting with an investor and they have a non-disclosure agreement in place or some sort of confidentiality agreement in place, um, those would generally not be considered public disclosures. So you could meet with an investor under an NDA um, 
and file your patent application after and still be okay. Uh, the challenge there though is, uh, or the, the risk there is, if the party you're meeting with breaches their non-disclosure agreement uh, and does share it with the world or tells somebody or, or publishes it on their website, um, your idea is lost. And yes, you could go after that company or that, that individual for damages for breaching the non-disclosure agreement, um, but you can't untell your idea to the world. Uh, so, that can, so generally, we do recommend filing before you plan on disclosing to anyone, even if it is under an NDA. Um, so this patent application process as I've been kind of referring to, it does fit in, it can, we can make it fit into whatever development cycle you are in, in your, in your process, or what kind of commercialization or where your business is. There are things called provisional patent applications where you can file kind of a very brief um, application in the US that never gets published. Um, and it gives you a year to kind of test the water, see where things are, develop your idea a little bit more um, before we have to file another kind of more fulsome application. So this can defer costs. Um, I'll have a, a table a little bit later on that we can expand on a little bit further. Um, so there are a lot of factors that for, for whether you want to patent, when you want to patent. Um, patents are expensive. Um, unlike, say, your commercialization agreements or your um, your incorporation articles and, and kind of basic legal um, pa paperwork, a patent application is specific to your invention. So there's kind of no form template that can be used. Um, it has to be a kind of custom written description of your invention. So the costs are high um, and their patent costs, their, the patent office is all charged fees. And so every country you want to file in, that's an additional fee. Uh, additional government fees, different translation requirements for different countries around the world as their fees. Um, and these all start adding up. Um, so some considerations of whether you want to file in, in view of these costs. Um, what are to convert the commercial life, what's the commercial life of your invention? Um, if, you, if your invention is gonna be um, a really quick, something that's going to be in market for six months, a year, then filing a patent is probably not a big deal, uh, or probably not worthwhile. Um, if your patent is something that you can keep secret, um, something that no one will ever see, maybe you don't want to file. Um, generally speaking though, especially in software and, and certain technologies that are kind of open out in the open, I think it's a little bit naive to think that somebody who sees what your, your product is doing, even though they don't see the actual code, they don't see the server and what's happening behind the scenes, if they see the output of your, your, your software, they could probably figure out how it works. Um, so I'm not sure if that it's, it's a good answer to, to say, well, nobody will see this um, and they won't figure it out. going to be mindful of time here. So the patent process, um, as I said, you can file a, pri a priority application for first filing anywhere in the world. Within a year, um, you can file it elsewhere, in, anywhere else in the world. Um, there's also something called a PCT, or international application. Um, there's no such thing as an international patent, but there is an international application. And so what this PCT international application does is it gives you the right to file in all the other countries that are part of this PCT agreement. Um, and that, will, that gives you the filing date of your PCT application, but you can defer entering those countries um, for 30 months. So you file a PCT application that gives you the right to file in Canada, US, Europe, Asia, almost everywhere in the world. Um, but you don't have to do those actual filings for 30 months. So that gives you potentially a year and a half to two and a half years to defer the decision of where you want to file for patents. That gives you the ability to decide where's my market going, where's, um, where's my business going to see if it's actually worthwhile. So IP has, um, 
depends. One aspect does not cover everything. You don't, one aspect is not the answer for everything. You can have overlapping technology, overlapping IP rights. Um, so for example, Vital Alert, which does sort of some kind of underground communication systems. Um, they have patents on their base technology that covers how they do these communications. Um, they also have different applications that are directed to how they apply these technologies, so safer detonations. Um, trademarks cover their brand. Um, the shapes and things can cover, are covered by industrial designs. Uh, copyright can cover their code. And again, trade secrets um, can keep things that they might want to keep uh, secret. So some useful websites, um, the USPTO, that's the US Patent and Trademark Office website is a good source. Um, it could give you histories on what's getting through the patent office and all the correspondence and, um, that happens during the examination process. Whoops. Um, the European and, uh, Patent Office is also useful. So IP strategy, um, again, we, we touched on why patents may or may not be necessary. Um, something to keep in mind is we should be evaluating every time you're dealing with some outside third party, whether you're covered by IP, who's going to cover um, what's being developed if you have a third developing, a joint, con joint development agreement, um, who's owning the IP, who's managing the IP. Um, are, your, are, you covered, uh, are your employees covered by, by your employment agreements? Do what they do, is what they do owned by the company? Um, do you have a, a procedures in place for disclosures? Um, when, before you go to meet investors, before you go um, put something on the website, So I touched on a bunch of these earlier. Um, so I guess some takeaways, um, just to kind of summarize, like you should have we always recommend filing something or having an NDA in place before you talk to anybody. This needs to protect your ideas. Your ideas have to be kept new. Um, make sure you have the proper agreements in place, whether that's with co-owners, whether that's with employees, whether that's with third-party contractors, um, that ensure that your IP is protected, that you own what you think you own. Um, keep track of what is being disclosed to different parties. Um, what information that you had known before you walked into these meetings, um, what information that you shared at these meetings. These can all become factual issues down the road if the other side says, oh, you didn't tell me that, or you didn't, um, you guys didn't have that before. We had that. We brought that to the table. Uh, so it's good to document these things beforehand, uh, whether that's through a patent filing or just internal dated uh, records. Um, So IP culture, um, really being aware of IP come, has to come from the top. So whether it's a manager or whether that's giving employees time to work on IP, whether that's for patent filings or recognizing 
um, or documenting when they're doing things, keeping lab books. Um, these are all things that have to be valued and have to be instilled kind of at the early stages, whether there's strict policies over disclosure, whether there's strict policies of managing files or where they're stored or whether they're uploaded to a, some public venue or Google Docs. Um, these are all important things to keep your IP uh, safe. Oops. Um, quickly, branding. Uh, trademarks are um, probably more important as you're on the later stages of your company. Um, but if you are going to the public, your brand is important. Um, picking a strong brand um, that is protectable from a, a trademark perspective. Um, a trademark should be, um, uh, the, the best trademarks are, are coined phrases, words that don't mean anything outside of, um, the, just on the face of them, sort of Xerox, Starbucks, kind of arbitrary words. Um, brands which are suggestive of what the product, product is are a little bit weaker because they're not as distinctive. Um, things like second cup that's kind of suggestive of, of, of coffee or, or some sort of beverage. Um, we're, phrase, things that are descriptive um, are definitely not strong brands. So we're, world's best pizza store would be a terrible brand because um, you can't protect that brand. Uh, you can't protect the word pizza. You can't trademark pizza for a pizza restaurant. Um, so anybody could open their own pizza store and call it my pizza store. Um, even if, that, if, if you had that same thing, you couldn't stop somebody else from doing that. So you need to pick a brand that's distinctive um, and something that, uh, make, that is not too close to what you're doing. Um, but it's not only a name. Brands are kind of, um, brands are not just the trademark itself. Um, for example, when you think of Apple, um, do you think of, it's not, it's more than just the, the, the fruit with the bite out of it. Um, what do you think of when you think of Apple? You think of a, a certain type of quality, a certain type of product, a uh, certain type of ease of use. Um, these are all things that are tied into your brand, which aren't necessarily just grounded necessarily in the word itself. Um, so it's important to manage that perception in the public of what your brand means, whether that's through consistent um, PR, consistent messaging in your brands and in your, in your things that are going out on your website and in your correspondence. Um, uh, designed quickly, um, these kind of just cover the visual features. Um, they're even used now for, um, for user interfaces. Um, a big, big fight in the U.S. with the, Apple and Samsung was based on design patents. So the shape of the iPhone and the Samsung phones, the arrangement of the icons themselves, these were a big part of that litigation. Um, and in the U.S. currently, if you infringe on a design patent, you get the full profits of that device. Um, so just because of the shape of the phone, if you found it infringed at, notwithstanding that there's a billion things going on inside the phone, the full profits of the phone um, are awarded for damages against Samsung. So um, that's been appealed to the US Supreme Court, so we'll see what happens there. But designs are very inexpensive um, filing, and they can be very, very powerful um, in protecting your products.